Hello, you're listening to 20,000 Hertz. I'm Dallas Taylor. The sound of a number being dialed on a telephone is instantly recognizable. But nowadays, how often do you really hear those sounds? When we call a friend, we just scroll down to their contact. When we call a business, we Google it, tap the phone number, and tap to call. Or we just ask our phone to call it for us. Calling Music Millennium. Up until pretty recently, every call you made meant dialing all 10 digits of a phone number, one button at a time. And that meant hearing those tones over and over. If there was a phone number that you dialed a lot, like your best friend or your parents, you'd eventually memorize what their numbers sounded like. Strung together, the tones would start to sound almost musical, like a jingle you couldn't forget, even if you tried. But before we can jump into the push-button phones that most of us are familiar with, we need to go back to the very beginning. There's still some debate as to who exactly deserves credit for the invention of the telephone. But we do know that Alexander Graham Bell was the first to patent it. That was back in 1876. A year later, Bell and his father-in-law formed the Bell Telephone Company. Over time, the Bell Company evolved into the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, or AT&T as we know it today. Wherever you are, you're never too far. They're waiting to share your day. Reach up, reach out and down. A quick sidebar. The distinction between Bell and AT&T gets pretty convoluted, and you'll hear them being used interchangeably throughout the episode. Reach out and touch someone far away. Give them a call. Right away, it became clear that AT&T had a monopoly on the new telephone industry, meaning they could charge whatever they wanted for phone service. This was especially bad news for anyone who lived outside of the city, since it was expensive to run miles of phone lines out to just a few houses. So to convince regulators that they should be allowed to operate, AT&T did the most obvious thing a major corporation could do. They struck a deal with the federal government. AT&T would promise to provide phone service throughout all of the United States, Canada, too. That's Annabelle Dodd, a professor, consultant, and author of The Essential Guide to Telecommunications. Then, in return, AT&T would not only provide the phone service, but would provide universal service where people in rural areas weren't charged anything higher than people in urban areas so that there was comparable prices throughout the United States. With the signing of that deal, the era of the telephone had begun. Soon, telephone lines were installed all across the country, but calling someone back then was very, very different than we know it today. The early years are very interesting. At the time, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, The United States was largely agrarian, rural country. People had phone service, but they didn't have a dial on the phone. They'd pick up the handset and reach the operator, and they would direct the call to whomever that person requested. And that telephone operator knew everything that was going on in the town and who was talking to whom. As you might imagine, being the gatekeeper for every phone call made in your town gave these operators quite a bit of power. In Kansas City, there was an undertaker. His last name was Stroger, S-T-R-O-W-G-E-R. That's Jim Hebbeln. He worked in the telephone industry for over 40 years and now volunteers with the Telecommunications History Group. And he was wondering why he wasn't getting as much business as his competitor until he realized that his competitor's wife was the switchboard operator in Kansas City. And so if someone asked for an undertaker, his competitor got the business. Stroger realized that if people could call each other directly without an operator, he could stop his rival from stealing his business. So, using a hat box and some mechanical equipment, he designed what would become known as the Stroger switch. It didn't have a dial at the time. Initially, you might have three buttons on your phone. You'd pick up the phone and one button would be labeled hundreds, another one would be labeled tens, and another one would be labeled units. And if you were supposed to dial 153, you'd press the hundreds button once and it would cause the switch in the central office to jump up. 
one level and connect to another switch, then you'd press the hundreds key five times, click, 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 and it would go up five, and then you'd press it, the units digit three times, click, 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 and it'd go over three, and it would ring their phone. The Stroger switch was eventually replaced by the type of phone we all know from the old movies, the rotary dial phone. To dial a number on a rotary phone, you put your finger in the corresponding slot, spin it clockwise all the way to the right, then pull your finger out while the dial spins back into place. For example, suppose you want to dial 23650. Dial each numeral in this manner, pulling the dial around to the finger stop each time. Be sure to allow the dial to freely return to its normal position. So those phone calls took, I think it was 11 seconds to complete dialing. And the problem with that was that the dialing tied up phone company equipment for a long time. The phone company couldn't handle as much traffic as they wanted to. To speed up long-distance calling, which still required an operator, the phone company developed a new switching machine called the Number 4 Crossbar. This was the first time a keypad of numeric buttons was widely adopted, though it was only available to operators. The operators had a key pulse to dial, but the digits were arranged in two columns of five digits per column, and they could just tap on these buttons and it would produce a pair of tones for each digit dialed. Since each number on the dial used a specific pair of pitches, the sounds they produced were called multi-frequency tones, or MF tones. The tones were 700, 900, 1100, 1300, 1500, and 1700 hertz. And some combination of two of those tones would represent each digit. For example, 700 and 900 was a 1. 700 and 1100 was a 2. 900 and 1100 was a 3. The Bell System saw the benefits of this multi-frequency touchpad right away. People within the Bell System watched these operators just be able to go push, 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 and dial these numbers rapidly in a couple seconds, rather than using a rotary dial. Bell wanted to get these push-button phones into the hands of customers, but the oscillators that made these multi-frequency tones were too expensive to mass-produce. In 1948, in the suburb of Media, Pennsylvania, Bell made a handful of these push-button keypad telephones and gave them out to customers to try out. They had six different length reeds that were tuned, and you could push the buttons one, two, three, four, five on the phone, but it would produce... Multi-frequency tones, like the operators did, by plucking two of the six reeds. Bing, 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 bing. Customers immediately loved the convenience of dialing with a touchpad. Unfortunately, the reeds weren't sturdy enough to stay in tune after repeated use, and the prototype was shelved. Though, in the 1950s, Bell experimented with different phone designs and eventually settled on using transistors to produce those tones for each key. They still hadn't decided on the best layout for the buttons, so they brought in a group of volunteers to test different button arrangements. And in the process of doing human studies, they decided the best kind of a dial was something similar to like what accountants used on adding machines, but the public didn't like the dial starting from the bottom and going up like adding machines did. They wanted their digits displayed across the dial like you read off a page of paper one two three across the top and then seven eight nine across the bottom accountants did not like touchstone dials but everybody else enjoyed the design arranging the buttons in a grid allowed bell to assign a pitch to each column and a pitch to each row each button pressed would simultaneously produce the tone from its column and the tone from its row These were called dual-tone multi-frequency, or DTMF tones. AT&T patented it with a catchier name, Touchtone. Hi, this is the Bell System's new Touchtone dialing. With this indicator, you see how many seconds you save the new way. Let's try it! Okay, I'll race you. Ready? Go. I beat you.
Although DTMF shares many similarities with MF tones, there are important differences. For one thing, they use a completely different set of pitches. So in the process of figuring out what tones they wanted to use, they picked some really odd tones that don't really match up with any tuned musical instrument. They're always off key. So they picked these bizarre frequencies like 697 hertz or 852 hertz for the different pitch tones. And unlike MF tones, which are only dialed at the beginning of a call, DTMF tone receivers are ready to receive a key input at any time during the call. By choosing these odd, specific frequencies, Bell made sure that nothing else from music to cars to human voices could be misinterpreted as a key press. Here are the numbers 1 through 9 on a touchtone phone. See if you can hear the two separate pitches for each button. If you listen closely, you can hear how the row pitch, which is lower, changes every third button, while the same pattern of three pitches for the columns repeats on top of it. Since the bottom row of keys had two extra slots, Bell added the pound and star keys. These buttons really didn't have an intended use early on, but later gained more functions. Things like dialing star 69 to find out the last number that had called you or star six seven to prevent the person you're calling from seeing your number on their caller ID. Touchtone technology would go on to dominate the second half of the 20th century, but it wasn't without a few hitches. After the break, we'll learn how people learn to hack the touchtone system and how these sounds might be disappearing altogether. Early versions of the telephone led to AT&T's patented touchtone technology. The phone company loved it because it tied up their switching equipment for far less time than rotary phones did. Customers loved it because, well, it was more convenient. Here's a commercial by CNP Telephone, an East Coast branch of Bell. It's a lot easier. And if you have to make a lot of calls, like what we do here in this office, it's just great to have. Well, with the touchtone, you're dialing the number as fast as you're thinking it. You're thinking uh, 411 for an operator, where with a dial phone, it's 411. My parents had dial service for years and years and years. It took me like a year to talk them into getting touch ten, and now they wouldn't give it up. This touch tone technology quickly swept the globe, and businesses developed automated answering systems that you and I know and love. It took advantage of this new DTMF technology. It became a way for entry into data systems. So the automated attendance, press one if you want to reach sales, press two if you want customer service, press three if you want to hold for three hours for our operator, you know. Most people hated it. Your call is important to us. Please hold. It may not surprise you to hear that pre-recorded phone menus weren't exactly popular, but there were some benefits. For example, you could enter in sensitive information like your bank account number or social security number without having to say the numbers out loud. Now, that doesn't mean someone listening in can't decode them, but that's another story. Another important use of these tones was voicemail control. You have three saved voice messages. To listen to your messages, press one. Voice messaging was a big application for touch tone. While answering machines that recorded onto tape had been around since the 1940s, the voicemail services that came out in the early 80s began storing messages digitally, and they relied on DTMF tones to control functions like restart, skip, and delete. The explosion of voicemail machines also led to a bizarre trend using kitschy, pre-recorded songs for voice messages. In the early 80s, a company called Formidable Inc. sold a tape of Teletoons with 13 different messages that people could put on their answering machines. Talk to this machine. Leave a message that you mean. If you leave your name and where at, I'll call you right back. But you can leave a message at the tone when I be. I'm in the shower. Can I call you back? I'm in the shower. Can I call you back? DTMF also had applications beyond the telephone. For instance, DTMF tones were used by TV networks to insert local commercials into national broadcasts. They were using touch tones 
to tell a local controller that they were able to then insert their local commercial for the next 30 seconds. So, let's say it's 1988. You're watching a new TV show called The Wonder Years on ABC. The show cuts to a commercial. After these messages, we'll be right back. First, you see some ads for big international brands. Nothing really gets to you like RC Cola can. Barney is back! Oh, yes, sir. New 2600 games from Atari. Bruce Willis. Die hard. Got invited to the Christmas party by mistake. Who knew? These ads are visible to everyone watching the show, no matter where they are. But then you see an ad specific to your area. Maybe it's for a local furniture store. Holland Furniture, you like our style. Now open south at 79th and Cicero. A DTMF signal transmitted by ABC tells the affiliate station when to insert these local ads and when to cut back to the main broadcast. In fact, before the technology improved, you could actually hear those tones during the commercial break. Here's a less than subtle example on A&E. You are watching the A&E Cable Network, the best in comedy, drama, documentary, and the performing arts. And here's one from Nickelodeon. Ready or not, fellow mutants, I'm back with more freaky facts on Next Kid Almanac. No discussion of phone tones could be complete without mentioning the freaks. That's freak with a PH. It's important to remember that even after phones started using DTMF to communicate with switching equipment, calls were still connected using those original MF tones. In the 60s, a group of college students figured out how to manipulate the receiving machines by producing these tones artificially. Most of them were just discovering how the system worked. They were curious. They were not out to make money. They were not out to fraudulently sell free phone calls to their friends for a whole lot less than what the phone company would charge. The key to hacking the phone system was reproducing a tone of 2600 hertz. It's around E or E flat, a couple octaves above middle C. I used to be able to whistle it, but I can't anymore. Which used to really irritate people. Because <laughs> if I'd walk in a room and whistle it and they were on a long distance call, it would knock their call down. By producing a tone of 2600 hertz, the freaks could trick a remote switching machine into thinking the call had been disconnected. From there, they could make long distance phone calls and disguise themselves as a call to a toll free number or directory assistance. So you had a little box that would manufacture the multi frequency tones and you'd just punch in dee 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 dee. And the other end just blindly put the call through, no questions asked. Famously, the freaks often used plastic toy whistles that came in boxes of Captain Crunch cereal in the 70s. If you glued one of the holes on the whistle shut, the whistle would consistently produce a tone at 2600 hertz. I have to admit I did it a couple of times using a Hammond organ to simulate the MF tones. It did work. I was satisfied that it did work, but... I didn't want to get in trouble because I didn't want to jeopardize my job. Like everything else, the phone industry was changed dramatically by computers. In the 90s, the phone system started to turn digital, and multi-frequency tones lost many of their original functions. So in other words, no more phone freaking. (laughs) Unfortunately, these technological advancements didn't translate to higher quality calls. You've probably noticed that phone calls still sound pretty terrible. This is because of data compression. To push all of this data, they reduce the audio quality as much as they possibly can. Way too much in my opinion. First, they chop off all of the low frequencies. This one kind of makes sense because most of us take calls on tiny speakers. Those tiny speakers can't make those frequencies anyway. But then, they chop off even more of the low frequencies. Okay, well, we can deal with that. But then, they chop off some of the high frequencies. Ugh, I'm starting to sound pretty terrible. Then, the audio gets hyper-compressed, meaning it kind of just brick walls and slams all of the audio at a single volume. To top it all off, the audio data gets hyper-compressed as well. So, here's where we land. Blah, blah, blah. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Gross, gross, gross. So, there's a definite trade-off between cost and, and quality. For most of us... Oh, hold on one sec. For most of us, the convenience of a cell phone is worth the trade-off. As for those touchstone sounds, they're really there just for show. 
It's just a digital packet. Your phone produces touch tones only to be able to do end-to-end signaling, like operating voicemail systems or automated attendants that answer at the far end. But even those uses are becoming outdated. Between text, email, and social media, we don't leave as many voicemails as we used to. When we do need to check our messages, we can do so through an app. No phone call required. And as for automated attendants that use touchtone sounds, those are gradually being replaced with voice recognition. You can say billing question, update address, or speak to a representative. It's very possible that within the next decade or so, touchtone signaling will be a thing of the past. Once it is, will phone companies even bother to put these useless noises onto our cell phones? Will the next generation even recognize those sounds? I mean, when was the last time you heard this? Or this? Just like those other phone sounds, touchtone sounds might slowly fade into oblivion before you even realize it. Whatever happens in the future, it's undeniable that touchtone had a huge impact on not only the telephone industry, but mass communication in general. And those of us who grew up hearing DTMF tones on every phone call we made will never forget what they sounded like. Twenty Thousand Hertz is produced out of the studios of DeFacto Sound, a sound design team dedicated to making television, film, and games sound insanely cool. Find out more at defactosound.com. This episode was written and produced by Casey Emerling. And me, Dallas Taylor. With help from Sam Sneebly. It was edited, sound designed, and mixed by Jai Berger. And Colin DeVarney. Special thanks to our guests, Annabelle Dodd and Jim Hebel, for taking the time to speak with us. Jim, um, last question. What is your favorite sound? It probably would be those multi-frequency tones. <laughs> well, just a second. I probably would say that comes second. I love you, you know, from my wife. To learn more about the Telecommunications History Group, the group that Jim volunteers with, go to telecomhistory.org or check out their museums in Seattle and Denver. And be sure to check out Annabelle Dodd's book, The Essential Guide to Telecommunications. The music in this episode is from our friends at Musicbed. Check them out at musicbed.com. Lastly, what is your most memorable telephone story? We'd love to hear it. You can tell us on Twitter, Facebook, or by writing hi at 20k.org. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.